You know, there used to be a time when technology stocks didn't even think about paying dividends. We're high tech, gosh darn it. Uh, we don't do things like uh, try to lure in widows and orphans with dividends. Uh, that, of course, has changed over the last few years. Apple among those that do provide dividends and just raising its by 5%. Uh, and investors are obviously excited with that. That and buying back $100 billion worth of its stock could close the deal right there. But uh, dividend-paying stocks are all the rage right now. And the case for dividend growth, author David Manson says, uh, it just adds to the appeal. Uh, this entire book focuses on that, investing in a post-crisis world where the insurance of a company paying you for owning its stock doesn't hurt. Uh, David joins us right now. Good to have you, Dave. Thank you, Neil. Good to be with you. You know, it's interesting, too, because we used to think of buying stocks based not exclusively, but largely on the dividend they pay as a little bit of security in retirement. But it's much more than that, isn't it? It is. I mean, that's one of the big arguments I make in the book is that you can view the dividend as a pragmatic benefit to owning the stock. And it certainly is. It's cash that you receive. But I think what gets missed is being able to view the dividend as what it signifies about the stock you own, the kind of stability of the company, the maturity of a business model that is able to repeatedly pay the dividend. And what is so key to our thesis to repeatedly grow the dividend over over time. Yeah, the growing it is a big part. You had said not too long ago, the payout ratio is important. If the company is paying out 90% of its profits in dividends, uh, they, they are not really uh, looking to grow a lot. If the company is only paying out 20% of its profits, uh, they're, they're not likely committed to dividend growth. What's, what's the sweet spot? Yeah, and the sweet spot changes sector by sector. Like, let's take REITs, for example. They have to pay out 90%. You're talking so about real estate So they're in kind of a different situation. But, but what, real estate investment trust, that's right. But there are some companies that are very CapEx heavy. They need a lot of money to reinvest into infrastructure of their companies. And so they may pay a lower payout ratio because they need more of their profits for reinvestment. Other companies are huge free cash flow generators and they get to a point. Boeing has been a great example of this where there is so much free cash flow being generated above and beyond what they need for CapEx, for growth, that they're able to pay real generously. But we have to look at it company by company. All right. Now, um, when you look at uh, yields, uh, and, and you, you've been a, a brilliant investor over the course of your career and managing, I think, in excess of $1.6 billion, but that obviously dividends are important to you. But there are different ways of looking at the performance of, of, of someone like you versus if you had just been in the S&P 500. Now, obviously, dividends reinvested and buying back into those stocks and all is, is, is one thing. But do you feel that a lot of people uh, are leery of dividends for the right reason, that they could get more bang for their buck just investing in stocks on which they have a good hunch are going to grow? Yeah, if all that an investor had done was come in with new money after the financial crisis, the Fed goes through three rounds of QE, they keep interest rates at zero, and you have the FANG phenomena take over and someone piles into that. They may not know that they ever need dividends. They may not know that they ever need balance and, and you know portfolio stability. I don't believe that that represents a permanent new paradigm of investing. We, we want something that will stand the test of time. And I think you look at the decade we just had, Neil, which was admittedly in a rebound out of the uh, financial crisis and with an incredible amount of Fed stimulus. And then you look at the decade before where the investors made no money for 10 years between two blow ups in both cases. Dividend growth investors did very, very well. I, I think that the issue is on a risk adjusted basis, how can you sleep at night? And I believe you can sleep at night better knowing those dividends are not only going to keep coming, but are going to keep growing regardless of what the market prices may do through their natural volatility. And our natural way of looking at the performance of various markets generally doesn't include reinvested dividends and all of that stuff. Once you factor that in, it is rare to find a period of time, an extended period of time, where you haven't gotten some bang for the buck out of it. 
And, and in fact, I will argue that even for regular S&P 500 investors, uh, the longer you go back in time, the, the larger of a window you're giving, the higher percentage that the reinvestment of dividends represents of your return. I think if you go back to the Great Depression, it's about 80 percent of the mm. return that an investor has gotten has come from reinvesting those dividends and allowing that compounding miracle to take place. You know, uh, we live in heady times. You, of course, refer to the 90s when we were looking at returns, you know, 1995 of 37 and a half percent, 97, 33 percent, 1999, 21 percent. The Nasdaq in 1999 up almost 86 percent. We remember, of course, the crashes that came afterwards. How do you find just the right balance? Well, for us, we find the right balance by not trying to buy everything. We really believe in being selective, and that selectivity criteria for us is around the growth of the dividend. And what it does is but it is tells that your, us so, what is management. Is that your most prominent goal? In other words, if you McDonald's has been one of those that provides a generous dividend and the stock has been on fire, they never send me a thank you note, by the way, but I'll let that go. But, but, but it, it offers the best of both worlds. I'm not here to sell McDonald's. I'm just trying to say you can sometimes find both, right? Yeah, well, McDonald's does give you a thank you note in the form of offering you incredible French fries and hamburgers. But Touché. the other thing that they have done... The other thing they've done is through the 1990s and through the period of all those huge returns and the technology going crazy, if you bought McDonald's at the beginning of the 90s, you right now per year are getting in a dividend what the stock cost you at the beginning of the 90s. 100% wow. per year cash on cash from what you paid for McDonald's. Procter Gamble is another example of a company like that. These are both companies that we own. And that is the type of thing that we're looking to do. Now, someone could come and say, hey, you're going to miss out on the great growth of, let's say, a Netflix or something. And I agree. There they're not going to be the dividend payers in their early stage of a company. Uh, but I look at Cisco and Intel and Microsoft and Qualcomm. They were the Netflixes of the 1990s. You're right. They're now the more, they're more mature companies with steady cash flows that are paying very generous and repeatable growing dividends. We're happy to buy a company when they're in that phase because our mandate is to protect client capital and grow income over time. Yeah. And even to add another dollar to the investment, uh, just the, the, the appreciation through the dividends where you could buy more or start taking it out in retirement is an option you don't get with, with a company that doesn't do that. that. That's right. And I think that there's that uh, two-pronged benefit for an accumulator like myself who is not withdrawing from his portfolio right. and getting the compounding of those reinvested dividends. But for a lot of the population that is in need to get income from their portfolio, the last nine years, Neil, they haven't had to worry about withdrawing in a negative market. But in the Good 10 point. years before that, it w you could blow up a portfolio, even if the return ended up catching up. Because the problem is the return would be catching up with less money in your portfolio. When you're withdrawing from just positive cash flow, you never are impacting your principal. And I think that's a very important that's concept very for investors to relearn. Yeah. All right. It's a great book, David. Uh, the Case for Dividend Growth, Investing in a Post-Crisis World. There are all sorts of definitions, right? You do that generally on stocks whose yields exceed that uh, the S&P average, I believe, around 2%. There are plenty of picks in that category and a way to sort of protect yourself. David, thank you.